Tamworth Church of St Editha is an Anglican parish church and is Grade 1 listed. It's the largest medieval parish church in Staffordshire and most of the current building was erected in the 14th and 15th centuries with some 19th century additions. It stands, however, upon the ground where successive churches have stood since the 8th century. And it's during that period that it's thought that Offa, first King of the English, built his palace on the site of what was to become St Editha's churchyard. It's now a garden of rest. The earliest existing record of a peal of bells at St Editha's dates from 1552, when church commissioners carried out an inventory of churches. Hidden away up in the church tower lie the ringing room and belfry, but it's no mean feat getting up to them. St Edith's is home to one of only two examples in the UK of a church tower double helix staircase. It was built sometime between 1400 and 1420. The staircase, as shown in this model, is actually two staircases that wind around a central stone column. On the ground floor, one entrance is from the outside of the building and the other from the inside. But it's only the inner staircase that gives direct access to the ringing room and the belfry before the two meet at the top. Perhaps the double helix allowed the town watch to access the top of the tower from the outer staircase without having to enter the church building. Nowadays, it's the views that draw one to the top. If you fancy tackling the climb, public access is allowed to the staircases, battlements, bells and ringing room on a number of advertised open days. Situated in the ringing room is a practice dumbbell on which learners can be taught bell handling and more experienced ringers can practice what are known as methods. It handles like a normal church bell and consists of a large round wheel with a heavy counterbalance weight to mimic the weight of a proper bell. The dumbbell can be attached to a laptop to produce a simulated sound and for more advanced ringing the computer can simulate ringing on any number of bells so you can practice on your bell while the computer simulates the others. Next time. <laughs> oh, so we wait for the next wave to come.
and then it's everybody play on the mask again. There are ten bells at St. Edifice, the largest of which weighs over one tonne. All the bells were cast at John Taylor's Bell Foundry at Loughborough, now the only surviving bell foundry in the UK. The bells are hung in the belfry so that the ropes in the ringing room drop to produce a circle, which goes clockwise from the smallest, highest note bell round to the largest, deepest note bell. The reason for this is that a circle allows the ringers to see each other easily, which is important when chained ringing. During the Middle Ages, the technology of how bells in England were hung changed. At first, bells were hung with just a lever to sound them. Then a quarter, a half, and finally a whole wheel were fixed to the stock that held the bell. Having a whole wheel enabled the bell to be revolved full circle and held in the upright position for as long as you liked. By the late 17th and early 18th century, a mathematical system of altering the order in which the bells rung was developed. This is known as English change ringing, which is unique to the British Isles and where the English have emigrated to such as USA, Australia, New Zealand and South Africa. My name is Boris Price. I am curator and organist at St Edithus Church. I work very closely with our musical director, Mr Ken Edwards. I deal with the technical issues arising from the uh, main organ here, uh, but I also take an interest in the history of the organs that have been here. The very first one that was installed in this church was built by a gentleman called Nathaniel Dudley. It was a small single manual organ. It was positioned over the west door and that position has now disappeared so far as an organ is concerned. In, it was installed in about 1715 and this current organ by Harrison and Harrison was installed in 1927. It's a wonderful instrument to play. This one is grade one listed as it has never been altered. There are no electronics in it. It is all air operated. There are 1950 pipes in this organ and uh, this lasted until 2017 when the organ was facing probably no more than three years life and we went to various contracts to sort it out. The whole project took just over a year and it was a great relief when uh, Ken actually, Ken Edwards actually came along and he played it and I'll never forget what he said when he came back and he played it, uh, some rather exotic piece of, uh, of Mendelssohn and he just said, it's back. We were very, very pleased. That total cost was divided in two ways. One, the desk and all of the keyboards here were supported by the Heritage Lottery Fund to the tune of £55,000, which we were very grateful for. The inside of the organ, which was really, really quite, quite dilapidated, cost us over £130,000 um, and it's a story which is a very sad story. There's a lady in the congregation said how much do you need and I explained to her how much we needed £130,000 and she very generously said I will deal with that for you and so she gave us a cheque for the amount to cover the, the whole of the restoration of the inside of the organ. But the sad thing was, she never actually heard it played again, for real. She passed away 
about six weeks before the whole thing was recommissioned. So we were all very sad about that. She insisted totally on remaining anonymous. Um, and uh, so we weren't even be able to commemorate her generous gift. But it's interesting to note that some of the pipe work from the Samuel Green organ of 1793 has actually been used in the restoration and in fact the early building of this organ and um, it really is, it, it, should, it should last at least another hundred years so um, we, we're looking forward to seeing that and I wish I could be around to see it. <laughs>